This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. With me, we're going to be discussing the featured viewpoint on Heart Rhythm Journal this month is Dan Morin, my predecessor and the originator of a lot of these featured articles with Heart Rhythm Journal. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much, Rod. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sure it's fun for you to be on the other side of the microphone here, getting we'll into about, about new data, new research. And the CMS cuts were such a big, big deal for all of us. It is our daily bread. It's our lifeline. And obviously, we did have some dramatic cuts, not as bad as they were before. But what's really relevant with this viewpoint is this is the follow-up survey of the impact of the CMS cuts on catheter ablation. Take it away, Dan. What did you, what did you look for and what did you find? Yeah, thank, well, thank you for uh, you know inviting uh, me here today. I'm representing a, a a committee, sort of an ad hoc committee of people who are interested in in health policy and especially in this issue uh, from you know throughout HRS, uh, including some staff of HRS as well uh, who were instrumental, of course, at uh, putting this together. And we were concerned, uh, of course, because remember uh, back in back in January of 2022, CMS uh, imposed those terrible cuts that were very dramatic and very sudden, uh, amounting to about 25 to 30 percent uh, of a reduction in reimbursement for uh, a lot of our ablation care that we provide to patients. Um, so way back when, you mentioned already that this was uh, this follow-up survey, we performed around the time of uh, the 2022 Heart Rhythm Meeting uh, our first survey, and that was conducted via emails and QR codes that we presented uh, at uh, at HRS, and we wanted to um, assess uh, physicians' perceptions of the effects of those cuts that maybe hadn't taken effect yet, but were going to. We got about uh, 517 respondents at that time, and and the overall prediction from the responses at that time was that the reimbursement reductions were, as I said, draconian and, and all of a sudden and were um, sort of hitting people uh, in a big surprise, interestingly, uh, that it was going to have immediate effects on practices that were going to require cuts in purchases and hiring, and that there was going to be long-term effects on access to care for patients and also on the training of our, of our fellows who were coming up behind us. And that was published in September 2022 issue of the Heart Rhythm Journal. Um, we had planned, even with that first one, to perform a follow-up study. Uh, during that time, during the six months uh, in, between, uh, in between our first study and our second, CMS proposed additional cuts of 6 to 20% more that were to take effect in January 2023, and they in fact have. We performed the second survey around six months after the first one. So this is October 2022. And we wanted to understand whether practicing EPs knew about the new cuts, which were even worse than the, uh, you know, on top of the first ones, what effects those cuts had already had and what effects were expected going forward. Well, and Dan, obviously the impact is huge because, you know, over 90% felt that they disagreed with the justifications for it, which there haven't been very concrete justifications, except for the fact that it's a zero-sum game in our healthcare um, system, and we, we understand that. But with regards to changing practices, you were able to find that almost 50% of electrophysiologists felt like they were not going to be doing as much electrophysiology and cutting down on nurse staffing as well. But I think what was really amazing about this was that 76% reported that they're going to do less complex ablation. Yeah, and that is, uh, of course, going to have uh, enormous effects as well on our trainees who need to see those complex ablations. Uh, and then ultimately down the line, it's going to affect the uh, ability of patients maybe out in uh, rural communities or uh, and whatnot to access ablation care uh, that is so very important to them, uh, because if we don't train trainees to perform those procedures, then there just simply will not be people who know how to do it, uh, you know, in the future. Well, and that's why I believe that this is an existential threat to the whole field of electrophysiology, because you don't train up the new ones that are coming in. And then the people that are practicing are being disincentivized, because we do understand that while everything in cardiology is important, 
the ability to read three or four echocardiograms should not probably trump or supersede, you know, the ability to perform one atrial fibrillation ablation. They're all important. But I think that we're quickly seeing that a lot of cardiologists, including myself, are almost incentivized to do general consultative cardiology over performing these complex procedures. And again, that's a loss for in terms of health equity and being able to be able to have access to something that has been shown to have meaningful improvements in quality of life and reduce mm -hmm. hospitalizations and potentially improve mortality. And that's always been my viewpoint is the data has never been stronger in the whole field over so many decades since catheter ablation became mainstream in the 1990s. It's never been stronger that the application of it actually has societal benefits that likely reduces overall costs. I agree with you. And, and so did all of the 585 respondents to this second survey. There was uh, no, over 95% of them agreed with the idea that the cuts were inappropriately severe and they didn't account for complexity, skill, and risk involved with the procedures. And they were concerned that uh, there was that uh, as a result of the pressures that were being put on by those, that they might even have to change their payer mix, including 44% of respondents who said that they may not be able to accept Medicare patients in the future. And this is the very people that CMS uh, serves. Exactly. And, and I think all, all most physicians, if not all, went into this field and this profession because they believe in healthcare for all. And, and again, when you start having to pick and choose, then that's the definition or the antithesis of the lack of health equality or health equity. Right. So you're mentioning why people you know, go into uh, electrophysiology and, and there may be fewer, uh, at least our respondents think that there may be fewer people who wind up going into electrophysiology uh, as the field may become less attractive. If you have to do more general cardiology, if that's uh, what you, if you, what you really want to do is electrophysiology, uh, and also if the reimbursements uh, are lower. In addition, on the other end, a lot of uh, respondents said that this was changing their retirement plans. So we're thinking about people who have been doing EP for decades, maybe some of them, and they're super valuable because of their experience and their ability to teach and whatnot. And maybe as a result of these changes, uh, maybe you know some of them are thinking about retiring earlier or going into a different field uh, altogether, maybe something that's uh, non-clinical. Well, this is a longitudinal fight. It's a longitudinal fight for preservation of, of a field that we deeply are passionate about and we understand the impact of society. We have to message it better to legislative authorities and have them understand what we do. I think that's what we've learned partly in those discussions as we engage um, offices of Congress. And we need to continue this. And I know that Harlem Society and you continue to push that. Where do we move forward and how do we move forward with this longitudinal battle. Yeah, so you know, I'm I'm very happy to hear through the uh you know, through the through the rumor mill so to speak, um that HRS is becoming more and more interested in becoming more of a um uh, of a uh, organization that does uh advocacy uh for you know, sort of outwardly facing um to more out to the public so that the public knows about what's going on and also to our elected officials. Uh, so that these changes can be counteracted and hopefully moved in the opposite direction. Well, we'll continue the dialogue. I think anytime you have the ability to speak to a, a policymaker, a congressional member, we need to see those seize those moments. Like, again, I believe that a lot of the Harlem Society members and anyone practicing EP have become more active politically. And we always think that that's separate. Oh, this is political. I just do medical. And you start realizing this is in, this marriage is important. That we it's have all intertwined, point. yeah. It's all intertwined. Um, I think that there's an, an EPATH meeting, which is um, at Heart Rhythm Society. We've got Heart Rhythm Journal Editorial Board. So we're looking forward to being together again um, after a very challenging year. But I do think that we were successful in reducing the cuts. But we need to continue this dialogue and not give up and keep preserving our field. You're absolutely right. Uh, so uh, I would uh, encourage our um, viewers to take a look at um, the publication of these results, uh, which are in the May 2023 issue of Heart Rhythm. Okay, Dan. Well, you used to be the interviewer. Now you have been interviewed. Thank it has you been so much a pleasure. for being a featured, featured uh, author. 
And thank you for your contributions to the Harlem Society and the journal. Thank you, Rod. Thank you for yours.